Good afternoon, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Andrew Ray and um, Dr. Craig Browdy for inviting me. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to come here. And um, as uh, Andrew mentioned, I come from the Aquaculture Pathology Lab. I just want to make a couple of uh, comments uh, before I get into the techni technicalities. Uh, my background is in plant virology. By academic training, I'm a plant virologist. And uh, I spent much of my career working on shrimp and fish diseases. Um, my introduction to shrimp was around 1996-97, when I was a postdoc at uh, Tufts University School of Veterinary Medicine. And prior to that, uh, I was working in Agriculture Canada, working on potato diseases. So after I took over this position, oftentimes people ask me, what's the connection between potato and shrimp? And I tell them, coming from India, potato and shrimp make good curries. <laughs> and out of blue, I saw it at lunch. We had potato and shrimp. So here you go. Um, our lab is a world organization of, for animal health reference lab for crustacean disease. We are also a USDA FIS approved lab, and it's an ISO 17025 accredited lab. What I'm going to do is to give you a quick overview of our lab in a couple of slides, and then I'm going to talk about what is biosecurity and why biosecurity, what are the components, a little bit about shrimp diseases. There are many, many diseases. There's about 25 diseases that are known to you know, cause um, different levels of infections and losses, etc. But I'm going to give you a glimpse, an overview of one bacterial, one viral, and a fungal disease, and some perspective on disease prevention and management. Um, we have two labs, one lab but in two campuses. So in, our, in, the, in the University of Arizona, we have a, in the main campus, we have the disease diagnostic lab, where we do much of the diagnostic work. Now, I should add that uh, many of you know or knew my predecessor, Dr. Don Leitner, who is pretty much considered as the father of shrimp diseases. And this lab is well known for its contribution, for decade-long contribution on shrimp diseases. Um, so it needs really no introduction. We also have another lab, which is about 10 miles from the main campus, the West Campus, where we have the animal facilities. That's where we do all kinds of challenge work and uh, therapeutics or development project and so forth. So our goal, so what's our mission? Our mission is with respect to the main campus activities, disease diagnostics is our primary job, providing service to shrimp industries globally. Just to give you a sense, last year alone, we provided disease diagnostic services to 36 countries around the world. Um, so that gives you a an, an, an glimpse of the depth of work and the breadth of work that we do. And with respect to diagnostics, we really have three components in the diagnostic areas. Histopathology, the routine way of you know, diagnosing disease, looking at uh, cells under the microscope, basically, or tissue sections, and some molecular, say PCR-based, uh, polymerase chain reaction-based diagnostics and microbiology. We also have an educational and training component. Uh, once a year, we have uh, what we call a shrimp pathology short course. It's really a hallmark of my predecessor, Don Leitner's contribution to shrimp diseases. Over his career that spanned over three decades, he trained roughly about 1,400 researchers, academicians, professionals around the globe. Today, if you go to any country in the world where shrimp is grown, I can guarantee you that you will find one or two people in that country at least who has gone through this lab and undergone some sort of training in this lab. So it's quite remarkable. In some ways, it's a little scary for me because I'm much smaller than Don. So it's a challenging and daunting task uh, to maintain that status. But nevertheless, I think we are, we are there. We also do what is called interlaboratory tests, or in other words, the ring test. Oftentimes, people call it proficiency test or ring test, which is 
Basically, we provide known infected tissue material to people around the world, primarily diagnostic labs, and then they run their tests, and then they send the samples. We evaluate just to judge how good they are doing. And by the way, we also, also participate in similar tasks to evaluate how we ourselves are doing. So it's not a one-way process. It's a two-way process. And we do basic virology research. Microbiology and genomics is the new space. That's where my background is quite a bit. In the West Campus, we do disease challenge work, as I mentioned. It's, it's our main animal facility. We test all kinds of therapeutics, feed and feed additives. And um, we are building diagnostic capabilities for fish diseases also. Uh, I worked uh, in the past on developing oral vaccines for fish, particularly salmonids. Um, Dr. Daryl Zori and others, and Robin mentioned some of these, and uh, I can't agree with them anymore that really when you talk about biosecurity, or let me back up and make a healthy harvest, there are really three components. It's a three-legged tools. You need to have genetically superior stock and this specific pathogen-free and perhaps if possible specific pathogen-resistant stock. If you start with the good seed stock, it has nothing to do with shrimp, really. I mean, you look at terrestrial agriculture or, you know, uh, terrestrial animal husbandry. You need to start with good seed stock. That's the basic thing. And, and then the next thing is the nutrition. You can't have just genetically superior lines. If you're growing crops, you can just put, you know, uh, BT-resistant uh, corn and don't uh, give them enough fertilizer. You aren't going to get good harvest. It's as simple as that. So you need to have a very good quality nutrition. And finally, these two alone cannot save you. You also need to have biosecurity and farm management. You'll be amazed. <clears throat> Let me back up and make a comment. Over the last year, I traveled 10 countries around the world, giving dozens of lectures from Latin America to Africa to Asia. And I myself learning a lot as I travel. At every opportunity I get, I go and visit farms. And you will be amazed that sometimes the people working at the firm do some, such a silly mistake that costs them so dearly. So management is a key component to be successful. So what do we mean by biosecurity? It's really pathogen exclusion. There are three components that are needed in order to cause a disease. If you look at the Venn diagram, so to say, you need a host, you need an optimal environment, and you need a pathogen. And these three things need to come together in order to cause a disease. So whether you are growing shrimp indoor or outdoor doesn't matter. What you, in order to prevent the <coughs> entry of pathogen, or, or, or in order to have a biosecure facility, what you need is to exclude pathogen from these three components. So, so long you have a genetically superior stock and good environment and good management, and if you can manage to exclude the pathogen, the chances of success is very high. So that's what we have to keep in mind. Bear in mind that if you take, let me give you some scientific um, uh, comments here, more, more critical technical comments. If you take a one ml of water from the ocean, it contains roughly around 10 to the power 10 to 10 to the power 11 viruses per ml. So it's really a viral or microbial soup. Now, out of that, only a fraction of those microbes cause uh, microbes caused disease. And even fewer cause serious disease. What does it tell you? To me, I don't need to be a rocket scientist. It just simply tells me diseases are exception in nature. Healthy condition is the rule. So when we break that, <clears throat> when we, so, so how can we, how do we you know, end up having so much of diseases? So what we are doing is bringing these three components together, and that's when we end up having problems. So what are the components of biosecurity? So really, in order to prevent a disease, we really need to have an, enough knowledge and understanding about what are the critical diseases. And how can we exclude them? In order to exclude them, you really need to know what are the diagnostic or the detection methods. There are bad guys there, but you need to know what are the bad guys and how they're killing. So those two things you need to know.
Once you know it, you're in a much better shape. I'm always, you know, I'm one of those persons. I'm never ever afraid of taking any challenges. And some of you here know what kind of challenges I've gone through in my life. Although I don't look like that I can handle challenge, but uh, trust me, I am. My fear is what I call fear of unknown. When I do not know what is causing this damage, that's when I'm afraid of. Diseases was there, diseases are there today, diseases will be there when you and I are gone. We do not need to panic. I hate these things. Every time you know, I go to different conferences around the world and people say, oh, there's a new disease, have you heard this? Big deal, so what? We just need to know what it is, how it is causing the damage so that we can prevent it. That's it. There's not, no rocket science here. It's just the way of thinking, actually, and the perception. So once we have the adequate diagnostic methods, I think we will be in a much better shape. But nothing can complement or what we call use of clean shrimp stocks. That is one of the pillars of successes. If you really want to be successful, you really need to start with a very genetically superior clean stock coupled with good nutrition. There is no alternative to that. And should there be any disease, we, we need to be more proactive. Even if there is no disease, we need to really understand very critically how we can contain, should there be any disease, and how to eradicate, how to disinfect, all those things we need to know. In other words, we really have to be proactive. Having said all of these, there are a couple of other things that you always have to be careful bear in mind when you are doing disease diagnostics that you may get false positive or false negative I should say and there are non-detectable pathogens even with the finest of the finest tools and technologies that we have there are limits of technology that you cannot you know overrule or, or deny so those are the factors I think we have to bear in mind so as I mentioned, there are over a couple of dozens of diseases. It was 1974 when the first shrimp disease, is called Baculovirus penny, was first reported. Since then, we have now about a little over two dozens of diseases. And of them, these nine are listed by OIE, or the World Organization for Animal Health, as most critical in terms of the damages, economic damages they cause, basically, and other factors. But as you see, most of them are viruses, a couple of them and bacteria, and, and one fungal. This one, this long tongue-twisting name, acute hepatopancreatic necrosis disease, it's also called early mortality syndrome, was the last one to be listed in this. Now this list is not a static list, it's a more dynamic list. By that I mean to say, there were diseases that were listed in the past, now they are dropped because they are not so critical, whereas there are new diseases that are being constantly coming and depending on the extent, these diseases cause damages. They may or may not be included in the OIA list. And there are certain guidelines that we follow. Just to give you a sense that <clears throat> these, this is how these viruses look like if you look under the microscope, uh, electron microscope I should say. And this guy, this um, shrimp and uh, <coughs> hemocyte iridovirus is a new one that has been added. What I want to emphasize to many of you, those who are just getting into shrimp business, that there are tools, technologies, and expertise available in this country, probably better than any other place in the world. On the disease diagnostic side, certainly I can say that we are the leaders. You don't need to know all the technicalities. All you need to know, there are people. Just like when you and I get sick, I'm not worried about that I'm not a doctor. All I do is I try to find a good doctor. Because I know there are good doctors and bad doctors. As simple as that. And I can tell you that we, you have very good resources here. You don't need to look outside. Um, <clears throat> this gives you an idea that most of these OIE listed diseases, and for that matter other diseases that are not listed now, but they were in the past. There are again tools and technologies, and most of these detected primarily by what is called a PCR, um, 
polymerase chain reaction method. It's a very sensitive method of detection. You need to detect a pathogen when, when the pathogen is present at a very low level. That's the most important thing. If you detect a pathogen when it has already been, you know, reached a very high load, big deal. I mean, you already have suffered the damages. It has no meaning. So we need to, <clears throat> you need to detect at very early stage and we have the tools. That's all I want to emphasize. Here is another challenge. <clears throat> there are many diseases that causes similar clinical signs. Just like think about you and I can have infections of, you know, bacterial infection, we have fever, you have viral disease that also cause fever. Clinical signs are manifestation of pathogen activity in the host, and the end product could be same. So if you look at a brood stock and it looks like stressed out, means it's quite reddish, it could be for varieties of reason actually. So that's number one. So, so, so you may say, so what? So we need to know who is causing the disease. Just like if you have a bacterial fever, if you have viral fever and you end up taking antibiotics, it's not going to help you, right? Just like that. So you need to know who is causing the damage. And second, there are a couple of other things with respect to these diagnostic steps. When pathogens are present at an undetectable level, there are some technological limitations, as I just mentioned. Even with the finest of the finest techniques that are available to us, it has its limitation. You cannot, you know, overcome that. And then there are technical errors during pathogen detection. There are human components also. All of these you have to keep it in mind. Again, as I said at the very beginning, to me, knowing all the components, all the variables makes me strong. It doesn't make me weak in terms of being successful. And that's what I'm trying to emphasize. So here's a <coughs> depiction of one of the most successful methods of detection and, and the outcome that you can have at the end. When there's an outbreak and you send samples to us and we detect a disease, yeah, I mean, it's done. Nothing I can do. It's over. So this is not the stage that you should be thinking. <clears throat> if we detect it at a stage when it is going towards this, even this stage is not the stage that you'd like to be. You really like to be somewhere around here when we cannot detect any pathogen in the system. Again, it's a, whether it's a pond or indoor, outdoor, doesn't matter. Conceptually, that's the thing. So, so how does it translate to your activities? I was just telling someone earlier that, you know, this gentleman was telling me that you know, they have time to time mortalities. I said, okay, so what should I do? I said, if I'm in your shoes, what I will do, when things are nice and going happy, happy, I will collect some samples and preserve them and save them. I don't want to send right away because <clears throat> if, you, if I have money, great. But if you, do, if you want to save money, hold it. The reason is next time you have a disease or if you have some mortalities, then you send the good one from earlier <clears throat> and the one, the, the moribund one from now. It will be easy for us to compare them and find out what is causing the disease. So that's an important thing. There are a couple of other aspects that I just want to quickly highlight that <clears throat> you are the person who is sending the samples. If it is your farm, you are collecting samples. So that you are a veterinarian who says, we don't collect samples. So sampling is very critical how we do it, okay? Let me go through <clears throat> these three Ds as quickly just to give you a sense. This is a disease, this uh, early mortality syndrome. The etiology, identification of the etiology, there was a lot of confusion at the beginning. But when things settled, this is how it turned out. The disease is caused by Vibrio, and there are many species of bacteria. Vibrio is a bacterium. It's a Vibrio parahemolyticus. It carries some toxin gene, and you need both. It's called PIRA and B. You need both of them to cause the disease. If you have one of the twos, you will not get the disease. The disease is present primarily in Asia, but now it's also present in the Americas. This is what <coughs> happens in the field when you have disease. The infected animal, 
the hepatopancreas is pale and atrophied, whereas healthy animals much bigger and dark brown color. Because the hepatopancreas gets damaged and it just slugged off through the gut, so the gut turns like a dark brown or pinkish. So those are the signs of this disease. We can <clears throat> do some cross-sectionings or histopathology, technically speaking, of the hepatopancreas. And this is how a healthy animals look like. This is how a diseased animal hepat hepatopancreas look under the microscope. Ignore all the technicalities, but again, we have the capabilities to easily distinguish a disease from a healthy animal. The bacteria carries toxin gene, as I mentioned, two toxin genes, and there are tools to detect using a method called polymerase chain reaction. Now, <clears throat> we can also detect, we can quantify, not only simply qualitatively say yes or no, how much of the bacteria is there. It is very important, particularly with respect to Vibrio, say, for example. If you can quantify what is the load of Vibrio in the system that will cause harm, then you are in a better shape. We are developing we are always improving the method, tools and methods. Now we have another method where I can detect all two of these and also additional genes just to make sure everything is running properly, basically. In 2017, we had TSB, I'm sorry, Appen outbreak in Texas, and we detected it. This is a, um, one of these is Texas sample, and you can see the two bands. It's just like the positive control samples. We know it. We know it's caused by Vibrio <clears throat> parahemolyticus, and we also know it is similar to the Mexican uh, Vibrio that caused the similar disease. And the pathology of these samples are very similar to the known pathology or etiology of Vibrio parahemolyticus. So all these are known, actually. Life is never simple. I don't need to say this thing. I think many of you know more than I do. This bacteria is unique. So recently we come across one of those <coughs> bacteria that carries both genes but does not cause the disease. It's even far more complex. Recently we have cloned the genome and sequenced, etc., and we know why, why it is ca causing that kind of you know, anomaly. The take-home message is the standard tools that we use to detecting this is not enough, and that's why we have to have more than one methods to making sure that we are not making any false diagnosis, basically. So all these things are available. This one is another critical disease, white spot syndrome. It was primarily, you know, started in Asia, spread to Americas. It's present all over now. And it continues to cause major damages, something that you have to keep it in mind. Here are the clinical signs. And we have the pathology, the tools to detecting that. We have the molecular tools to detecting these, all kinds of molecular tools. And you need to have a surveillance program with respect to this pathogen also, along with a couple of other critical pathogens, just to make sure there's no chance of entry of this pathogen into the system. This is the last one I want to mention. <clears throat> this is a slow killer. It's a fungal disease. It does not kill immediately, but it causes major damages. It retards the growth, and often time when the gut should be more pinkish or, or the uh, light brown color, it becomes a whitish. Uh, it, it's, a, it's an emerging pathogen, and it has far more ramification than anything else. Again, we have the pathology and molecular tools to detect it, we, and we can do it happily. With respect to disease <coughs> prevention, as I mentioned, there is no alternative to preventing the entry of pathogen into the system. And I think, I put this in red for a reason, because this is most critical for indoor shrimp farming. You really have to take every step to prevent the entry of pathogen into the system. And certainly, pathogen-free broodstock is great, but if you have resistant lines, that could be even better. <coughs> There is no alternative to resistant lines of shrimp. Coupled with that, you have the management or prevention strategies in place, and there are many such, probiotics, immunostimulants, even functional feeds available. So if you combine all these tools and technologies, um, I think 
will be in a relatively better shape than we are. This is my team. Um, I'm very fortunate to have really a number of colleagues, graduate students who work tirelessly to maintain the integrity and, and quality of our work. This is my finding, uh, funding source. And one last thing, if I may say, those of you, <coughs> many of you have been in Arizona. I have, I have been there for a year and a half. It looks apparently pretty dry place, but if you come in the spring, the valley blooms, and it's just amazing. In other words, to me, appearance is often deceptive. Thank you all. <laughs>